Hello, and welcome to Let My People Eat, a podcast that provides satisfying talk about kosher nutrition. Here we clear through the clutter of nutrition speak, arm you with the clarity and confidence to eat, feel, and be your healthiest every day. I am Jill Sharfman, a board-certified holistic nutritionist living in Los Angeles. And I'm Dr. Andrea Moskowitz, a neuroscientist and psychiatrist in Los Angeles. I use my training and experience to integrate positive lifestyle changes into my patients' lives. Hey, Andrea. Hey, Jill. How's it going? It's going well. We haven't done this in a little while, and there's some exciting things to talk about with Let My People Eat. First of all, we are part of the Jewish Coffee House platform. And we join other podcasts like the Francesca show. um, And we're very excited about that. We're also on the Naki radio platform on the portal there. So if you have a Naki radio, you can listen to Let My People Eat there. Uh, We've also started a Facebook group. So come on, join us, talk to us there. Um, So, Andrea, here's my question for you. When Yantif comes around, do you get excited about it? Do you dread it? Do you like think of all the cooking? Of course, this year is going to be very different because we're not going to probably be having guests and maybe not even going to shul. Right. So, you know, it depends. It's been different in different years. This year, I'm pretty excited. I'll tell you why. Um, You know, my older, our older daughter got married and she lives in Israel. She lives in in Yerushalayim, right? Right. And she's been telling me for a while about this um, cook that she follows and has, who has like um, a whole Facebook thing that she follows and that she's even able to go to the same spice person that, that this cookbook author gets her spices from. So she was so excited that she ordered for me a cookbook from this author. This is true. And it was delivered to me and I opened it up and I was really excited. And it said, Peas Loving Carrots by Danielle Renov. And my daughter had or had sent that to me before you told me who our guest today was. Yes, we, that's a great story. And we are so excited that today our guest is uh, Danielle Renov. She is the blogger and influencer behind the popular brand Peas Loving Carrots. From her kitchen in Israel, she creates delicious and approachable recipes, lifestyle tips, and hacks, and shares all things motherhood and family related. But mostly, it's food. Half Moroccan and half Ashkenaz, Danielle was born and raised in Long Island, New York. Soon after their wedding, she and her husband, Ellie, moved to Israel, where they lived with their children ever since. Hi, Danielle. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. We are so excited too. And um, so the question I had for Andrew was about, you know, Yantif's approaching. And I know some people love it and get super excited. Some people are, they dread it a little bit because it's a lot of cooking, a lot of entertaining. I think I fall somewhere in the middle. I do love to entertain and cook, but I have to say one of my favorite things to do is to get a new cookbook because that definitely (laughs) inspires me. And I can't wait to try it, all the new recipes. So I was so excited when your cookbook came out. I've already made the the short ribs, which were delicious for Shabbos last week. I was about to week. make those. Like when we hang up, I have like everything ready. I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah, it was so great. So um, first of all, tell me, how would you come up with the name Peas Love and Carrots? So it actually started as my Instagram handle. Um, when I started my account, I had sort of been working on a cookbook for a few years and I had a manuscript ready to go. And then once I was like really done with the manuscript, I was like, okay, next step is a publisher. And I started looking into it. And I realized that like really writing a cookbook, writing the manuscript is only half the work. And I just didn't have time in my life at that time to create a book. My husband travels, I live in Jerusalem and my husband travels back to New York every week, every other week for work. And I was alone with three little kids and it just couldn't happen. So I just sat on my floor. And then one night in the middle of the night, I was like, you know what? I see all these chefs cooking on Instagram. Like, let me just do that. Let me just post the recipe of what I make for dinner every night. Maybe people would like that. So I went to create a handle and the name that I had like played with for the book was taken. I don't even remember what it was. That's how insignificant it was. And literally this just popped into my head like peas loving carrots and it was like a message from Hashem because the person was taken and it was instantaneous it wasn't even like 
oh, let me find a new name. It was like, oh, okay, peace, love, and carrots. Like, I don't, I don't even know where it came from. And I instantly was like, oh, this is me. I love this. I connect to this. It's amazing. And I went with it. And because, you know, for me, this book is really a huge thank you to my community on Instagram that has supported me and been with me on this journey that I've connected to, that I've become friends with, that's a part of my family, that's allowed me into their homes. Um, I really felt like it was important to name the book Peace, Love, and Carrots as sort of an ode to that community. Right. Well, I have to tell you, the book is beautiful. It is huge. You. you have a lot of recipes, a lot of <laughs> photographs. For me, photographs are so important. I need to have yeah. that visual so I can see what I'm trying to do. Um, I also love in the beginning, you have your six basic rules to following a recipe. Um, so people who are new to cooking can kind of start to dip their toe in and things like that. You also have 86 things I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> that page has caused so much conversation <laughs> oh my gosh well I have to first of all I love number 18 because you say listen to a podcast while you're cooking to make it more pleasurable <laughs> so definitely right. people listen to let my people eat while you're cooking through Danielle's book um number 25 raisins I also do not like raisins in my kugel <laughs> right <laughs> but you have bananas and marinara too you have some kind of no bananas. I don't, you know no what? No raisins. I'll tell you what. It's it's funny because my publisher also, Art Scroll, who's been amazing, and it's been such a great journey with them, was also with a few of the 86 things. They're like, I don't know. I don't know about this. And I really just didn't second guess myself. And I really fought for like what I wanted in there. And I'm like, no, I have to leave it in there. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I don't like raisins. I don't like bananas. And I don't like marinara sauce. So like, I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat. Like, now you know what you're getting. But also, what does that tell you? It tells you that everything in this book are things I like. You know, I, I didn't create a recipe for you. I, I, I'm i not trying to make, meaning like, just because you love banana cake, that's amazing. But I'm not going to force a banana recipe out of myself. That's not what I can give you because I don't like bananas. So you're not going to find that in here. Every recipe in here is something I can give you because it's something I like. It's something I eat or it's something that I may not always like, but in this application, I do like it. It's, it's real and it's authentic to who I am. And I think this is the best possible version of that recipe. That's great. Does your husband appreciate all your cooking? I feel like there was something no. in there. No, no. My husband eats like a four-year-old and that's not even an insult, but he'll say that. Um, my husband prefers schnitzel and wacky mac, not together, although, you know, if he could, he probably would. Um, but he really loves schnitzel. He really loves wacky mac. He's like one step away from being a vegetarian. He like, you know, meat comes from the freezer. That's it. He can't think about it any further than that. It needs to be burnt, burnt. I, I don't even want to say well done because well done is an understatement. He wants his meat burnt. Um, he won't eat lamb. He, you know, I would say the one thing that he really has going for him food wise that we connect to is that he really loves very spicy food, like the spicier, the better. So that worked out really well for me. Cause if you have the book, you know, there's a deep love of spicy food in my heart. So, <laughs> thank God for that. But, um, I don't mind because I really want to cook what the people want to eat. So I'm happy to make him schnitzel and I'm happy to make myself a, you know, medium rare steak. It's all good. <laughs> So, Danielle, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of your recipes draw on your, the Middle Eastern influences that you have. And um, you learned from your mother and grandmother how to cook. What is something that you learned from them that you use every day in the kitchen? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, well, my mother and my grandmother are not Middle Eastern. They're Moroccan. Um, but, you know, the cuisines are more aligned. Um, than let's say like Eastern European. Um, I would say, what did I learn? I, I learned so much that I apply every day. It's really hard to narrow down. I guess something really basic and fundamental is just cook what you have. You know, I think like if you're following a recipe and you don't have an ingredient, figure it out, substitute it. You know, my mother... And my grandma, I mean, I'm for sure my grandmother in Morocco, I tell people this all the time, you know, 
there's a million recipes for Moroccan fish. This is my grandmother's recipe for Moroccan fish. This is how she makes it. This is how I make it. I think it's the best because, A, it's meaningful to me. It holds a lot of memories. Um, and, you know, that's what I grew up eating. So that's the flavors I like of it. But if you find a Moroccan fish with carrots, it's very likely that maybe they had a carrot patch in their backyard. So they put carrots in. Or maybe they didn't use saffron. Maybe they used paprika because they didn't have saffron. Um, so, you know, there's no real rules when it comes to flavors and swap outs and things like that with cooking. I think more important is the technique that you're using to get the final result. Um, and I think that's something that my mother and my grandmother do really well is that kind of, you know, ebb and flow through the cooking process in the kitchen. Great. Okay. So as someone who's very Ashkenaz, um, my, <laughs> you know, one side was Hungarian, one side was German. Um, what recipe, cause I, my husband loves Moroccan food and whenever we go to friends who cook that way, he's very excited. What recipe would you recommend from the book as somebody who doesn't, didn't grow up cooking that way? That would be like a first entry level step into cooking oh. a mor- good Moroccan dish. Okay. Okay. A gateway Moroccan dish. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> a gateway Moroccan dish. Well, so spicy or non-spicy? Let's say, let's go with spicy because he loves spicy. <laughs> Fine. So personally, I think salad quick, which is just sounds so simple because it's like a, like, it's like a dip, right? It's just tomatoes and peppers. Um, that is a really delicious one because A, you could put it on sandwiches. You can eat it with a piece of grilled chicken. You can eat it with meat. You mix it into your eggs. It's actually the best base for shakshuka. Um, you can do so much with it. So that's something that's Moroccan that I really love. And I've literally never had anybody come to my table that doesn't like it. In fact, my husband, my father, and one of my friends, not, none of them like peppers. And they all like salad meat. Like, it's just really delicious. Um, it is spicy, though. But I would say probably it's the pastella, which is the Moroccan shepherd's pie. Because... Even my friends growing up that came for dinner on like that was like a weekly dinner in our house would eat that. You know, it's mm-hmm. a layer of mashed potatoes, a layer of chopped meat, another layer of mashed potatoes. It's just that the flavors put in are like a little bit Moroccan, the turmeric and the potatoes and the creaminess and things like that. And it's really, really delicious. And it's sort of it's pretty mild. And it's meat and potatoes, which is pretty, you know, familiar to the Ashkenazi palate. Yes. Okay. I think that that's a good place to start. Um, I have two, it's a two-sided question. What dish okay. in the cookbook are you most proud of? And then which is your favorite? So they can be the same, but they don't have to be the same. Um, I think I'm most proud of getting the Moroccan recipes down on paper. <laughs> You know, I don't think this is exclusive to Moroccan. I think probably Hungarian grandmothers are very similar to this. And the Lebanese and the Polish and the German, you know, getting a recipe from your grandmother and then figuring out how to quantify it in actual, like, numbers, teaspoons, tablespoons, cups, is so difficult because, you know, I cook it the way my grandmother cooked it, a handful of paprika. But then you're like, you know, you got to scrape that paprika into the measuring cup. To make sure you have every ounce, and then you have to make the dish again to make sure that the the measurement that you sort of tried actually is consistent and produces the outcome you need. So I'm really proud of those like passed down recipes that I was able to quantify for you. <laughs> um, that's really you know that was a huge feat for me. Um, and I don't really have a favorite dish. I'm a very moody eater. I feel like people can relate to this. I wake up in the morning and I'm in the mood for something. And if I'm really, really in the mood for dumplings, which granted is most days because dumplings (laughs) are delicious, but if I'm in the mood for dumplings and you give me the most delicious, I don't know, chicken, even though it's the most delicious chicken, it's not going to do it because I want the dumplings that day. So, you know, I feel like I don't have a specific favorite because it's what I'm in the mood for right now. Um, and each one of these dishes is my favorite version of that dish. This is how I want to eat a banh mi if I'm going to eat it. This is how I want to eat my 
you know, Moroccan stuffed artichokes if I'm going to eat it. Uh, so that's that, that's really yeah. what I try to do here. It, it sounds like dumplings are your favorite recipe. <laughs> I do, I do love dumplings very, very much, which is why I couldn't give you just one recipe for them. But, um, you know, like I also love lentils and there's like, I think there's three lentil soups in the mm. book, three different lentil soups, That's great. but I, I love all of it. I don't know. Cool. Okay. So let's talk now about Yantov because Yantov's coming and people are starting to think about, I see people are posting recipes and menus, um, what tips and tricks can you share that, you know, have made, you know, obviously you love to cook and be in the kitchen. And I think that's half the battle. Um, but how do you approach your yuntiv prep? So I do, first of all, I love yuntiv and I love cooking. Um, I can't say that I always love the marathon cooking that's specifically related to this season of Yom Tovim. Um, I love P- Pesach. It's actually my favorite holiday to cook for. I love it um, because there's no advanced prep and sort of once it's done, it's done. And then you have, you can cook, you know, over the course. This specific grouping of holidays, you know, they come on hot and heavy. And there's also, you know, a really strong emotional and spiritual component that you really want to leave yourself time to tap into. So actually about four or five years ago, I kind of changed the way I cooked for it. And I really spend the month of Elul, like preceding Rosh Hashanah. And I try to be really smart about it. I'm not a prep ahead cook. I don't meal prep. I don't do anything like that. Thank God I have, you know, a family to feed and just getting dinner on the table every night is enough. I can't make five dinners at once, you know, but specifically for this month, what I have found is that I have a month before, if I can make two or three things a week, and stick them in the freezer and have them as like each meal I can pull out three things and then I only have to make three more things. It makes my cooking much, much easier. And I'm not stuck in the kitchen for an entire week before the holiday comes. Um, So I try to be very mindful and thoughtful about what I prepare. Uh, Personally, I am not a fan of defrosted chicken. I do not like chicken to actually sit in marinades for too long. I think that's clear in the book. Um, I don't like that stringy, chickeny consistency that happens. So I try to make things that really work well in the freezer. So like meat sauce, excellent. Meatballs, excellent. Bourbon braised brisket, pomegranate, um, bourbon braised brick roast, uh, short ribs, pomegranate brisket, the slow roasted deckel, um, things like that. I'll make one or two of each, you know, the meatballs, I'll even make two or three of and freeze in containers. Uh, I'll make uh, the vegetable barley meat soup. I'll make that, put it in containers, stick that in the fridge because soups happen to be the one thing, like they really just get better after mm-hmm. the freezer. Like the flavor comes together. I'm a big believer in that anyway. Um, and desserts, cookies, cookies freeze really well. I'm going to make a batch of the raspberry oat bars. I'm going to make a batch of the inner child's cookies. I'm going to make the chocolate mousse. Uh, You know, I'm going to make a few of those things and stick them in my freezer. And then if I kind of only have to make like a fish, you know, a dip or two, a salad and a chicken, I'm I'm halfway done. And I love that. You know, I'm not like a kugel, kugel server. My side dishes are always like roasted vegetables and tiny schnitzel is a side dish in my world. I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so happy. I'm happy to hear about the freezing because a lot of um, people you speak to are very anti-freezing. Like, oh no, everything has to be fresh. And I, I I'm a big. It. I, I yeah. hear it because fresh food is better. I, I I relate to what they're saying, but I also relate to like you know my sanity is also better. So <laughs> so there's that, and and I don't think that means that you should freeze everything. I don't think you should freeze the potato kugel. I don't think that you should freeze some of the dips. I don't think you should freeze things that are going to separate or congeal or do weird things or have weird textures. But there are a few things that you can freeze for a short period of time. I don't think that cooked food should be in the freezer for more than four weeks, maybe six weeks if you're really pushing it. Um, You you know, it says in the 86 things, you're going to write your date on everything that goes in the freezer and you're going to be mindful to really pull things out and, you know, also reheat it properly. And 
yeah, this is the one time of year I do what I have to do. It's not the most ideal, but it actually is the most ideal because I go into the holidays like a normal human being, you know, and that's, that's worth it for me. Yeah. I think people like when they think about Yansif, like they think about the cooking, like that takes up such a big space in their brain. Um, and that's, it's not really, I mean, it's part of what Yansif's about, but it's not really all what it's about. And, you know, especially Pesach, people get to the Seder and they're just exhausted because they have just right. been cooking and prepping. And that's not really what the Yantif is about. So I, I like your approach that you give yourself lots of time, you freeze what you can, and then you kind of mix and match, which is what I've been doing too. I also used to be very specific about my menu planning and say, okay, this meal is this, this, and this. And then what I started doing is put is cooking things, putting them in the freezer, and then saying, you know, I'll take that, those short ribs out and exactly. we'll take those cookies out and we'll take, you know, and kind of just putting together my meals that way. And I just felt it worked so much better than trying to stick to this very specific preordained kind of menu that I had to, that was it. I, I agree with you. And I actually think a really good tip mm-hmm. is, you know, two years ago, I even started, I take a piece of paper, like a legal paper and I tape it to my freezer. And as I stick things in the freezer, I actually, like, I write the name and I'll write, you know, Roman numeral, not Roman numerals, uh, tally marks Mm. of how many of them are in the freezer. And I've even gone so far as to put a lead pencil on a string and tape it to the freezer. So as (laughs) I pull something out, I can erase it. This way I know exactly what's in there and what I have left. And like, it's not a guessing game. It's easy and it just, you know, I walk over to the door, I see what's there. I'm like, oh, okay, great. We'll have this and this meal and I'll fill it in with fresh chicken, fresh fish, this salad and whatever. Right. And it's great. I think a lot of people also spend a lot of time freezing challahs because, you know, challahs are, but I don't know, you know, circle challahs take up a lot of space in the freezer. And it, it, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I won't do the challahs. <laughs> yeah. No, they, that's true. They do. Um, and it's good if you have, I've, you know, you have that extra freezer space. Some people don't have it. So it's not even an option for them to do it. Um, and also, you know, for desserts, I mean, we all like dessert, but sometimes when you have all these meals in a row, you know, putting out fresh fruit, like watermelon or grapes at the end of right. a meal, it's totally okay. You know, you don't have to have, you know, the whole, you know, million different things. And we, we talk about that in general, like, you can put out a very specific, you know, you don't need 20 different kinds of uh, kugels to accompany your meal. So I actually like, like, because I do the freezing in advance, I'll put out, I'll have in my freezer, like four or five different types of cookies. And then what I'll do is I'll put out a lot of fruit and I'll make a cookie platter with Mm -hmm. like, you know, a few of these cookies, a few of those, a few of those, a few of those, and I'll put that out. And this way, I feel like I contributed something like homemade to the dessert course. But it's like, and it lasts me the whole holiday because I'm only taking out a few for each meal and it works really well. So, so here's the question. Um, you have, you have five kids? I have seven. Seven kids. Can I know her? Okay, Andrea. <laughs> So here's my question, Um, because this always used to be a a difficulty for me. So I'm I'm there cooking, I'm preparing for Yentif, and it would be all very nice if everyone from the whole family would just leave me alone for a number of hours so I could finish the cooking. But of course, that doesn't happen, especially when you have kids or or husbands, too. And they come in. Right. (laughs) And they insist on being fed in the middle of your preparations for the Chagim. So any like tips for handling that or things you have on hand that you can sort of quickly satisfy people with? And Honestly, dinner those days is like the worst possible thing to have on that day. <laughs> Some days you just wonder like, what is it with dinner and laundry? Why do they keep coming back? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty forgiving on myself. Like if, if I have to order pizza for dinner one night, I'll order the pizza. Um, a quick pot of noodles is never that far away or that difficult. 
you know, if I'm making the meatballs that day to pop in my freezer or for Yantif. So everybody will have a bowl of meatballs for dinner and great, lucky that, you know, that's a great dinner. Um, Also for me, my easiest go-to dinner and my most crowd-pleasing dinner in my house is always Israeli salad, rice, and grilled chicken, like on the grill pan with spices. And like that never takes so long to make and that can sort of happen in the background of what I have going on. The most important thing for me is to remember to defrost the chicken in the morning. (laughs) Like That's half the battle. (laughs) <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. And yeah, I mean, I think either, like you said, taking from what you're making or making a little extra is really the way to go or leftovers from the night before. It does take a little thought and a little planning. So you're not caught flat footed, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard, especially now where the kids may not even be in school. They might be home on well, zoom. Right. And the challenge there is that, you know, you also have lunch to deal with. Sorry. Right. Yes. No, it's, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot now that we're dealing with that we haven't had to deal with before. And especially if somebody's a teacher and they're trying to teach and their kids are home and it, there's, a, there's a lot of change now. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, let's see. So you, how do you handle your shopping? Do you shop every day? Do you shop in advance? So shopping in Israel is a little different than how it looks in America. You know, um, our kitchens aren't very big. We don't really, closets are not a thing here. Like apartments and homes are not built with closets. If you have any closets in your house, you have to actually go out and buy a closet unit and put that in a room. (laughs) So we don't have very much storage space. It's just not how we live here. Uh, So I do more often, I do shopping more often than you know, I would if I was in America. Um, it does free up like brain space though, because I only really have to think about what I want to make the next day or two, which is great. Um, but I don't mind it. You know, I live eight minutes from the shop, which is literally the best place in the world to shop. And uh, oftentimes I find that it's my shopping that invigorates me to go home and cook. I see a product, I see a produce, uh, you know, something that's new, that's in season. Um, the vibe of other people doing their shopping, it kind of like gets my juices flowing and I'm ready to go home and, you know, get in the kitchen. What, what ingredients do you always have though in your cupboard? Like what's, what's always there? I always have like a fully stacked spice cabinet. Um, I always have grains. I like, of course, Grains don't go bad and they're just always like, they're your friend. They're always there for you. (laughs) You know, if all else fails, you can make rice, you can make barley, you can make quinoa, you can make lentils. Um, So I always have a good selection of grains. I always, there's a few canned products that I always keep like canned corn. I keep because I can do something with that quickly for my kids. I would say my freezer is more of like a pantry for me. I keep a lot of frozen vegetables. Like Mm. I have bags of frozen broccoli, bags of frozen cauliflower, frozen corn. I prefer the fresh frozen vegetables to the canned vegetables, Um, frozen artichoke hearts. So like I'll always have, you know, like I could even make broccoli, roast it, and then add it to eggs for my kids for dinner if I'm ever really in a bind. Um, Eggs is always something I have. And then in my fridge, I would say produce-wise, I always have carrot, celery, onion, hot peppers, tomatoes, um, lettuce, some sort of lettuce vegetables. I really, my family really likes endives and fennel, so I always have endives and fennel. Um, But I know that's obviously not. And, you know, onions, lemons. uh, I actually don't always have potatoes. I only buy potatoes on those days (laughs) for chillin'. Um... (laughs) We're not a huge potato eater, but I also always have an, like an eggplant or two because eggplant can actually like sit on your vegetable cart for like a week or two before it goes bad. So there's always an eggplant. There. That's great. <laughs> do your kids, food. do your kids help you in the kitchen? Are they? Yeah. My involved? kids love to cook. Great. When I was, when my oldest was two years old, my mother bought me, I think it came from Target. It was like a counter stool kid helper thing. It's like a box sort of that your kid yeah. stands in um, that brings them to the height of the counter, but it's boxed in so they can't fall out. 
And um, since then, my kids have been with me in the kitchen from the beginning. I give them a plastic knife. I give them cucumbers. I give them pickles. I give them charred tomatoes. And they cut, not nicely, but it doesn't matter. And then they eat what they cut, and it's great. And they make their own pizzas, and they help me make cakes. And obviously, I don't do this every day because, you know, you really have to do what works for you. And it doesn't work for me to cook with them every day. So I try to find days that it is that I do, and I, I bring them into the kitchen, and I love it. And they're, they're pretty capable. Thank God. That's great. That's, great. That's really great. Um, do you have any last-minute tips, anything as we go into this next season, anything else that you want to share with our audience about, you know, approaching Yanta cooking, cooking in general? I think this is really a really, really good year to embrace like the less is more concept. And, you know, maybe instead of making three different meats, find a meat that maybe isn't the two second, you know, throw a bottled sauce on that you would make for one of your three meats. Find one meat that is maybe a little bit more involved that you wouldn't normally make and treat yourself to something really delicious and really wonderful that's maybe out of your comfort zone, but maybe you have the time to give to because you're not making three different dishes because you're not looking to feed a crowd of 20 people and need this huge variety. Um, So I would say really, you know, take advantage and embrace, you know, the situation we're in. You know, there's a lot worse things to be than stuck with the people you love and you know I think we can find a way to enjoy it and make the most of it I love that um okay so thank you Danielle um you can get Danielle's cookbook uh at artscroll.com and is it also available in other places it's available in most bookstores and Amazon at Amazon. Amazon. Okay. okay. So um, you can visit Danielle's website at peasloveincarrots with an N mm. dot com. Uh, her Instagram is also peasloveincarrots, and that's with two R's and one T, right? <laughs> would <laughs> not no uh, yes two yes. hours and one two. Oh my gosh yeah we somebody i guess set up a fake instagram account and we don't want to support oh. them so make sure um you spell carrots correctly when you go to follow danielle on instagram <laughs> um you can follow me at let my people eat um i want to thank our engineer mike Cassantini at the network studios today Uh, We also have a Facebook group, search for Let My People Eat on Facebook to join the discussion. You can ask questions, suggest topics you would like us to talk about in future episodes. And Let My People Eat is proud now to be part of Jewish Coffee House, where you can find your fill of stimulating podcasts dedicated exclusively to Jewish content. So, Danielle, thank you so much. This was, I have so many more questions for you. <laughs> so, we'll we might have to do this again sometime. We might have to do a part two, yeah. a follow up, um, just so I can, uh, I can ask no. the rest of my questions. But um, thank you so much and have a great Yantif. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. And that is it for this episode of Let My People Eat. Please visit our website at letmypeopleeat.com and leave us a comment get in touch at our email at podcast at letmypeopleeat.com or call us at 317-659-0004. Post on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook with the hashtag letmypeopleeatpodcast. If you like this show, please make sure to leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Tell your friends and family and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. And please remember that although we are certified professionals, This is not a medical advice podcast. No content, posts, or comments should be interpreted as professional guidance. Always speak to your own health practitioner about making the right life changes for you. Until next time, I am Jill Sharfman. And I am Andrea Moskowitz. Thanks for joining us. And go in good health.